afraid to begin with, I have to tread on familiar territory. In middle school, <laughs> in middle school, we moved into a new town. And uh, it was a very small town, a lot of centennial farms, a lot of real in crowds. You had to live there about 30 years in order just to know your neighbors well enough to call them by their names. And man, I was starting school. And so I became very, very kind of withdrawn. At the same time, like many kids my same age, I was getting really tall, really fast, really skinny, and just had a bad body image. So I did what a couple others did, and I didn't bathe. I thought that was a good way to kind of just stay inside myself. And it did kind of tend to make people stay a little bit away from me. Gave me a nice big personal space. I really couldn't understand why the other kids wouldn't, you know, come closer. But one day I was sitting in the social studies class, and I was just kind of idly contemplating the world, you know, doing one of these things. And I looked down at my desk and I went, holy crap, there's a pile of dirt there. And so I started going, I went between my fingers, and there was a pyramid of dirt. And I went, oh man. So I knew something was going on, but I wasn't quite smart enough to figure out, you know, how could I get out of this funk? My mom and dad, nevertheless, were also very worried about this big, stinky kid that was living in their house. And so they asked, um, one of my uh, foster brothers, if he might be able to help me. He was working at the animal shelter at the time, and they said, we think little Georgie needs someone to take care of so that maybe he can learn to take care of himself. So we need to find him a pet. And Danny, my older foster brother, said, you bet, I'll keep an eye out. A couple of weeks pass. Meanwhile, I'm making pyramids of dirt on my desks. At least I'm getting my wrists clean. And Danny calls and says, hey, I got the perfect pet for George. Um, he told my mom the story. In Michigan, around Grand Rapids and all the way up into Traverse City, there's a lot of dog racing, dog sleds. It's a huge competition. And you make really great money with these animals. And so these animals are a business. Now, they're like in all businesses, there's good people and there's bad people. Well, this one man had a full-blooded timber wolf that he'd gotten illegally from Canada, and he was wanting to breed it to some of his females, but it was getting too close to racing season. So he wanted to wait until racing season, the wintertime, was done, and then he'd breed them all. And then he'd have all these partial wolves. And a wolf-dog mix for a racing dog is a wonderful thing, according to those guys, because number one, they have huge paws like snowshoes, and they go through that snow like nobody's business. Number two, narrow chest like a ship. They just cut through tall drifts. And number three, they will literally pull a sled if you ask them until their heart bursts and they die in the traces. Now, you don't want to have them do that, but they will pull like nobody's business. And so those three qualities, if not taken to an extreme, are very desirable traits. Well, this male wolf was smelling all these females going, what's up with this? So he broke the chain that he was fastened to, and he bred with a female. This pissed the guy off, because this was one of his lead females. And so after eight weeks, she had her eight cubs. While they were still being born, he took them, umbilicals attached, and put them in a cardboard box. And once all eight had been delivered, he took the cardboard box and put it in the back of the garage, closed the door, and walked away. A week passes. The neighbors can no longer stand the noise that's happening in that garage. And my foster brother is called to go investigate. In Michigan, because of the sled dog issue, if you went to a sled dog establishment and you had good reason to believe there was a animal cruelty going on, you could actually go into outbuildings. He, he asked me, he was, is this the garage? He says, oh God, it was terrible, just terrible. So he broke in. He found the cardboard box. Six of the cubs were dead, covered in maggots. Seventh one was still a little bit alive, but was being eaten alive at the same time. The eighth one was still there, alive. Somehow it avoided all of the, the filth. He disposed of the six, he humanely put the seventh one down, and he took the eighth one home. This is the animal that he was going to give to me. Now this cub, she was seven-eighths timber. 
This cub had never once tasted mother's teat, never once had the warmth of mother against this cub. When I walked into my foster brother's living room, no one told me what to expect. We were just going to visit Danny, the guy that used to beat me up. And I looked across his living room, through everybody else down at the floor, and saw the most beautiful pair of clear blue eyes. They looked at me, I looked at them. Please understand, this eighth grader fell in love with those eyes. I walked straight over to that animal, nothing that needed to be said. We were, we were bonded immediately. Now, because she'd never been fed, she had rickets. Her front paws, instead of being normal, the bones had twisted because she was busy trying to, you know, cannibalize herself to keep herself going, which is a, a vengeful no-sum game, but she was making a game effort. We took her to the vet, and the vet said, oh, that's rickets, we can do this and that and this, and we can fix her. So we gave her calcium supplements, the legs straightened out. She started getting more energetic as she started getting food. She became frisky like a, you know, a teenager. Uh, she was wonderful. She was the first animal, the first living being that I considered truly my friend. If you've ever had one like this, you understand. You know, if it's a bad day, you go into your room and you're, ah, I hate my mom and dad, she's a bitch, my dad, I wish you'd just die. And you're in there just, ah, I'm mad at the world. Star knew to come to me. She knew if it was right to put her head on my lap or if it was just to be close. She saved me. I would have gone down the rat hole. God knows where I would have gone. I don't know, punk rock or something. <laughs> but that star saved me. Finally, a star came in the heat, and we found this really cool three-quarter wolf. His name was Thor. He was a noble beast. So star and Thor met <sighs> love. It was sweet. It really, it really was sweet. And the two of them, of course, did what two animals of that type will do when they're introduced in that kind of way. And eight weeks later, we had cubs. Eight beautiful little wolf cubs. Now, my family is really informal with animals. In the living room, my mom put up a couple one by sixes on the corner, some blankets, and that was the cubs' den. That way, right from birth, they heard us, they smelled us, well, they heard us when their ears opened, and they smelled us, but we were there. The vibrations, the life of the, of the family was around them all the time. It's like, you know, having a baby listen to things. Well, that's kind of what we were doing, too, getting them used to the rhythm and the flow of our house. Because with a wolf, you have to establish a pack. You can't just call them a dog. If you try to treat them like a dog, they'll eat your sofa. And so you have to come to an agreement with them. That's what you do. So Star had these cubs. Now, I remember this because I was really excited. The cubs were about three, four days old. Their eyes were closed, their ears were closed. They were still mew, 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 like that. And uh, mom was gonna take me to Kmart to give me some red kids. Oh, they were just the coolest thing. I wanted high top red kids. So we went to Kmart, sitting in the front seat of the Volkswagen van, it's our family vehicle, and came home with red kids. And I was so excited about them. We came into the house and we wanted to take a look at the cubs. And we went over to the bed and the one by sixes were falling over. There were like a couple cubs in the bed and then there, were, there was a cub in the living room floor and then further across and then further yet. Now, my folks' bedroom was right next to the living room, right next. So we followed the trail of cubs, kind of like, you know, breadcrumbs, put the bed back together and put them back in the bed, went into my mom and dad's bedroom and heard noises under the bed. Looked under the bed and there were, first thing we saw were two cubs nursing away, having a good old time, and Star having a fit having a seizure. What had happened is she was in the bed feeding them and she felt something going on. And so she tried to get away and knocked over the one by sixes. They of course just smelled milk 
And so they followed her. She tried to get away from him, she couldn't, so she physically wedged herself under the bed so that her thrashing would not injure the cubs. So we took the last couple of cubs, put them in the bed, and uh, I remember this, we got right back into the Volkswagen, the kids were still sitting there, and I held on to Star, like this, sitting in the front seat of that Volkswagen, as we raced the vet. Uh, he was very used to us, the people with the wolves. And he, we, he's carrying her in and going, oh my God, oh my God, with this huge look of panic. And he looks at her and he goes, oh, it's just eclampsia. And I went, what? He, okay, bring her into the examining room, took her in. He said, it's a calcium deficiency. Some mammals, humans included, um, when they're nursing, will take all of the calcium ions and they'll put it into calcium for the milk. They don't hold it all back for themselves sometimes. And if you don't have the calcium ions to make your muscles twitch, then they twitch irregularly, a fit. And so he gave her a shot, she calmed down, and he says, you know, Star's had a really tough day. She knew him, he knew her, they were friends. He said, why don't you let me take her out in the back into her favorite pen, let's give her a vacation from the kids. He, said, he says, I know your dad comes back at five o'clock. I'll stick around, um, just, I'll give you a call and let you know that you know, I'm still here and that you can come. So, okay, great. So we go back home, Star's really calm, laying down, you know, smiling and wagging her tail. And if you don't think a dog can smile, you're a fool. But she's smiling and wagging her tail and we went home and kind of played with the cubs, had a great time. 4.30, quarter to five comes around, dad starts pulling into the driveway, the phone rings. Mom picks it up, it's the vet. Oh, oh, really? I see. What had happened was the vet went in the back room. He was going to let Star go out for one more bathroom break in the back run and then get her ready for us. And he walked into that room where the pen was and he walked up to the pen where she was and he said, she was laying there, you know, just kind of taking it easy. He said she opened her eyes, looked up at him, put her head back down between her feet, and died. He says, I have no idea. Eclampsia is not fatal, it's not mortal. He says, I have no clue how Star could have died. He asked me, after I comprehended that, he asked me if he would be able to send her to the University of Michigan, which is a world-known veterinary training hospital. And I said, sure. So we went home, and he also set us up so that we could feed these cubs, because these cubs had to be fed every three hours. So I got a long plastic tube and a big syringe and a couple baby diapers, and every three hours I'd have a cub in my arms and thread the tube down his throat. He'd be laying there, mew, mew, mew. I'd hit the plunger, mew, mew, mew. Put it up on my shoulder, burp it, next one to go. The people at my school allowed me to leave school so that I could go and feed those crazy cubs every three hours. I got up every three hours at night. I didn't go outside and do things. I stayed around so I could keep those cubs going. Finally, a couple weeks later, the phone rings. It's the vet. He said, Star's back. The vet hospital sent her back. And I also know what has killed her. Could you and your dad please come when he gets home and let's go ahead and talk. So dad came home about quarter to five, 10 to five, got into the Volkswagen van, trundled over to the vet's office, and the vet sat him and I down and he says, well, to be honest, three things killed Star. He said, she could have handled any two. But the three things together did her in. The first thing, of course, was that early mistreatment, that whole week where she had no sustenance. Her body aged like three to five times normal aging just because she was taking all the nutrients out of her organs. So they were just aged. Second thing was the eclampsia. It certainly had a contributing factor because it weakened her entire system. He said, but the third thing and the most likely probable cause of her death was the ball of hamburger with a wad of strychnine coated wheat in the middle. He said, somebody poisoned your star and it was purposeful. 
They hand fetter this ball. Okay. He said, okay, now, while you're kind of looking at that, I've got Star. Do you want me to take care of her? And I said, no, I want to, I want to do it. She was mine. I wanted to do it. So Dad and I got back into the Volkswagen, and as I look at my lap, I can see it. The box was this big, by this big, by this big. They had fit my star in that box. And I held on to that box until we got home. I took that box and I put it on the front porch. It was time for dinner. And I told Dad I want to do it myself after dinner. And he went inside, and you can excuse me, but you know, I had to see her. So I opened up the four flaps. I untwisted the twisty on the big plastic bag, folded that bag back, and they had done a beautiful job. They had put her back together. She was laying there in that box like she used to lay out in the wintertime with her tail around her nose, looking for all the world like she was asleep. So I knelt there for a minute and I cried, and then I put myself back together, put the bag back together, closed up the box, went inside with everybody, ate the meal, and then I went outside and took Star. It was November. It was an incredibly cold November. It was frost in the ground. All the branches were all white. And I went to the backmost corner of the property and I took a pick, and I broke chunks of frozen dirt wide enough and deep enough until I could take that box with my star in it and I could plant her in the ground. And on my hands and knees, I took those chunks of frozen dirt and I put them on top of her to give her some kind of a blanket, some kind of a cover. And I, when I was done, I stood up and I looked up. And you know how it is, sometimes you just, something hits you in the face. And it was the three stars of Orion's belt. I stood there and I looked at those three stars and I cried. I was 16, I'm 57. Not a night goes by, especially in the cold months. That when it's dark, the first thing I do is I look at the sky and I look for my star. Now over time, others have joined her, my mother, my father, relatives, other animals, of course, that were close. But the first person that I think of is always my star. Someone much wiser than me once said that your truest immortality is not necessarily in the blood and the skin and bones of the people that you sire, but in the hearts and minds of those you leave behind. That's where your immortality lays. Although Star's body perished all those many years ago, every time I go outside and look at Orion, she lives. Star lives. Thank you.